So welcome back everybody to the Big Cat Sanctuary where we're going to go for our first conservation conversation debate. And we're joined today by Ian Jones, who's uh, head of carnivores at Paradise Wildlife Park, the Zoological Society of Hertfordshire. Mr. Giles Clark, who's our director of cats and conservation. And Chris Shepherd, who's the founder of Monitor. Welcome gentlemen. Hello. Hello. So for the guys at home, this is uh, going to be a new series for us of uh, conservation conversation debates. So we've, we've had presentations at the Big Cat Sanctuary from some of our conservation partners. This is a new series where we want to explore some of the issues that are facing animals out there in the animal kingdom and also, you know, the online, the frontline people that are working in conservation. So we want to explore how that's affecting the work that they're doing and how you guys at home as supporters can maybe get involved and have an impact on what's going on out there. So, and our first topic is the illegal wildlife trade. Now, you guys would have seen Ian, I think, and, uh, and Giles about, Ian's obviously been doing our Facebook Lives from the park, and uh, Giles, well, he's been on the telly a lot. So, if you don't recognise his face, then you should do. Uh, and obviously, as part of the day today, you've got a chance to see big cats about the house again. Uh, you can download by joining Team Spots and Stripes. So, you can see Giles and Mayor and Willow all over again uh, today. But Chris, you may not have met before. And like I say, Chris is the founder of Monitor. So I'm just going to hand over to Chris for a, for a second so you can maybe explain a little bit more about what Monitor are and what they do. Chris, over to you. Sure, thanks. Um, I've been working on wildlife trade for about 25 years, largely focused in Southeast Asia. Um, three years ago, I established the, the organization Monitor um, with the focus of looking at species that largely looking at species and issues that other, other organizations or people aren't looking at. Looking at species that need more attention. Uh, a lot of species are, are, are being wiped out and being decimated by the illegal wildlife trade without anyone even realizing this is happening or even a lot of the species, no one's even heard of them. So th these are the species we're trying to, to support and to help out and, and uh, to protect from the illegal and unsustainable wildlife trade. That's amazing. Thank you. And yeah, obviously for us, uh, you know, big cats are the focus. Um, but with most of the conservation work we support, we, we like to take that holistic approach. We like to work with organizations that it may be the catalyst is the cat that's there, but obviously they're including the entire ecosystem, including the human beings that are involved and looking at alternative livelihoods. So it's fantastic to have you with us, Chris. Um, with that, though, I think we probably will start off with uh, a more familiar cat for the people that are out there, so maybe the tiger. And I know, Giles, you've got some experience uh, with that and the, and the illegal wildlife trade based around tigers. So maybe, Giles, I can ask you, what's the current situation with, with tigers and the illegal wildlife trade out there? It, it, the one thing when we talk about a species, you know, even as one that's as, as well known and as popular as, and as charismatic as the tiger, it's always really hard and, and the media are always the first to do this. They, you know, people want to grab onto numbers. How many did there used to be? How many are left? You know, in terms of years, do they have left, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, it's really, really difficult to accurately um, be able to, you know, pinpoint these populations. We, you know, you need to take in all the information when we look at a species in terms of, um, it's habitat, how much habitat is left and all the other pressures as well as obviously one of those pressures being the illegal wildlife trade. So when we talk about tigers, you know, the first sort of tiger crisis, if you like, came to, um, came to our attention way back in the early 70s. You know, that's when we realised that their numbers were below, estimated to be below 2000 at that particular time in India. Now, realistically, that was probably a underestimation, but we certainly were aware that, you know, without intervention, they were going to disappear. And, that, and that's over the decades now being replicated across the whole of their range. If you think about tigers as a, as a species, it's split into different subspecies. We've already lost several of those. So when it comes to the pressure of the illegal wildlife trade, it's, it's driven by 
uh, the demand for their bones, their body parts in, in the best part. In some countries, it's, it could be things like their meat, which is consumed, or their skins or their pelts, so to speak, are in demand. So you have different demands in different regions of the world, but far and above anywhere else, it's probably the demand, and Chris could you know, talk with, uh, with a lot more experience firsthand than what I can of this, but it's the demand for their bones and their body parts going over to um, uh, China and the Far East and Vietnam that's really, really you know, pushing them to the edge of extinction coupled with those, those other, um, other pressures, if you like. And so I think, you know, this might be a, a good time just to quickly touch on the fact that to try and combat that, some countries have historically set up what is effectively farms. So you, you have a tiger farm, which is producing hundreds, if not thousands of individual tigers that are, are obviously bred um, and then are, um, are slaughtered like a, a factory, um, like a factory animal, like a like an industrial farm animal, and those products then enter the trade to try and reduce the demand from the wild. But th there's all sorts of problems with that. First of all, not only just ethically and morally, um, and from a welfare perspective of those individual animals, but actually what you tend to find is when we do that with a species, all it does is increase the demand for their wild counterparts it increases you know um uh, uh confusion within the consumers etc cetera, etc cetera. what's illegal what isn't illegal so yeah, really interesting, so it's, really interesting yeah i just think chris just to bring you in there so what's what's your thought charles has mentioned about that about strategies like farming mm -hmm. on the ground have you seen that work anywhere with not just tigers but with any any sort of uh, illegal trade with animals yeah, we've um, looked at farming issues and captive breed, commercial captive breeding issues for uh, a wide variety of species, largely in, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and to be honest, I haven't seen one example. I can't give you one example of where commercial farming or commercial captive breeding of wildlife has, any, has had any benefit for wild populations or the conservation of wild populations. We like to say um, commercial captive breeding is a conservation tool. I, I don't I don't buy that I, I um, it's in, in many cases it's a good business a lot of animals do breed well in captivity tigers breed well in captivity but there's no evidence showing that these farms are taking pressure off wild populations poaching levels are not going down demand for wild taken tiger parts um, is not disappearing it's not being replaced by the farming and by the commercial breeding we've looked at this with tigers we've looked at this with with um, Asiatic black bears, with toke geckos, with a wide, a huge range of bird species. And within Southeast Asia, the, 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 there's no evidence that this is, this is helpful at all. In fact, it's probably detrimental. Um, opening up captive breeding and commercial captive breeding and farming creates opportunities for laundering of wild caught species, wild caught animals in, uh, into, the, into the global market. Uh, laundering is a, is a huge problem. Millions of animals are laundered into the international market every year. It creates opportunities for corruption, um, organized criminal syndicates running uh, the wildlife trade rely on corruption to facilitate their trade. Um, farming opens all kinds of doors for corruption and it, and it seems to send the wrong message to consumers. If, if it can be bred in captivity, well then conservation for wild populations is no longer a priority and, and and um, it, in some cases, it seems to have even stimulated uh, the demand and, and created a, a, an increased demand for, for these wild, wild animals. Yeah, okay, and, and yeah, it sounds like it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy situation. So just, just throwing that over to you, Ian, I mean, you know, back home, um, you know, and you get in a normal situation, obviously not, not now we're in lockdown, but in a normal situation, you get thousands of members of the general public coming through to Paradise Wildlife Park, and I know you've got some, some education programs coming through there, but do you get a sense from you know, the British public that, that, that they're aware of this situation um, with, with illegal wildlife trade? Well, you know, I, I think everyone seems to be aware that, that there are problems and tigers and lots of animals are under threat. And, 
you know, I think there's a problem with the fact that, you know, it, it's not right there in front of them. If, it, you know, if, if you can't see it, it, it seems to be a bit of a harder problem for people to get to grips with. Um, you know, I think the last 10 years alone, um, wildlife agencies have said that at least one third of tiger parts that have been that have been seized in the last 10 years have actually come from captive breeding um, whether that's been legal tiger farms in countries that don't uh, that didn't sign the CITES um, or whether that is um, you know from illegal places and it is happening all over the world you know luckily I don't think we've ever had it in Britain so people don't think about it as much with tigers in the UK but there is problems with the pet trade and there is problems with illegal breeding and the exotic pet trade in the UK especially and most people don't see it I mean I could go onto Facebook right now and probably find you a cheetah or a serval that could be shipped to the UK um, and even get around you know having a DWA license and um, th these all contribute to the problems that, that most people just aren't aware of they think because in the UK we're animal lovers you know it, it doesn't happen over here but I, I think we're heavily involved in it and I think you know there's corruption in governments all over the world there's corruption in a lot of countries all over the world where where wildlife is disappearing and you know this is all contribute contributing to that wildlife trade problem yeah it's difficult right because I mean if people aren't aware um, but also I think you know Giles you've said this in the past you know if we're not we're talking about tigers it's like one of the iconic animals you know the most the most popular animal on the planet probably um, and if we can't do something about that trade then you know as Chris said it's it's not just those big cats it's so many other different animals and you mentioned the Asiatic bear actually I think Giles you've got experience of, of seeing that when you were out filming in, in Asia recently. Exactly so last year as, as you guys know I spent pretty much the whole year um, in Laos in particular um, but also across several other countries and I would go into go into markets and see wildlife for sale on a on a almost daily basis but also you could go into you could go into shops and um you did not have to look very hard to come across very well organized commercially packed wildlife products so that included bear bar which is what i was looking for at the time and this, and this one particular shop i went into um was a, an entire wall was devoted to uh, tiger products made from tiger bone wine etc etc and it was I, I, although i'm fully aware of it it was still so unbelievably shocking to see see it on the scale but also just how well structured and organized it was the, these weren't you know recycled glass bottles these were commercially produced um, labels, packaging, you know, very well advertised. And so, it, you know, it, it, it gives you an idea. And that's part of the, the challenge is that, you know, when we talk about the illegal wildlife trade, it's exactly that. And it, it's illegal, but it's run by criminal networks and syndicates that are incredibly um, well funded and driven and motivated because of just how much it's worth. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, like said to be the third biggest illegal trade, right, across the planet. So, I mean, so, so going back to you, Chris, we've talked about farming, not necessarily a viable solution. You know, we need to educate people, sure. But what, what solutions are there out there that you think might be viable? Very good question. I, I don't think there's a single answer for, for that. I think... I think dealing with this problem relies or is going to require a, a multi-pronged approach. Um, you mentioned education. Education and awareness is, is really important. I think, I think um, ignorance of the issue, um, people are just not aware of the issue or think it's something that happens somewhere else, is probably our greatest obstacle in conservation when it comes to dealing with, um, with the wildlife trade and, and the consumers that are, that are fueling the wildlife trade. A lot of people are involved in, 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 in fueling the wildlife trade and, and supporting the demand without even realizing it. You might go to a pet shop and, and um, see some tortoises there. They, while they're in a pet shop, it must be legal. But really, do your homework. They're probably, you know, there's a good chance they're not legal. Your snakeskin bag or boots, I'm sure you bought them at a legal shop, but they may have been sourced illegally in the country of origin. Uh, Giles mentioned manufactured bear biomedicine. It, it, it's 
it's in a, a reputable shop. Uh, must be legal, but it's not. There's there's no there's no legal international trade in in medicines even claiming to contain bear bile. Um, so consumers really need to educate themselves uh, and educate other people around them. Uh, we, everyone has a role to play. It's not something for other people to do and something that happens in other countries. It's happening everywhere. Everyone can, can play a part. Educate yourself, become a, a smart consumer, educate other people, support conservation initiatives. Um, and and um, you know, it's, it's almost a cliche, but be as green as you can. Yeah, great. Would you agree with that, Ian? Uh, yeah, hundred um, percent. You know, education is definitely going to be key. I think when you've got things like traditional Asiatic medicines um, that we know have absolutely no medicinal purpose whatsoever, they don't cure anything. Um, you know, and people can take different parts of the tiger, for example, for you know anything from toothache to headache to even curing nightmares in some cases. You know, so it, it, it's a shame that we're using this product and. I think you, you need to get through to the next and the younger generation coming through and that that's where education will definitely come in and be key. You know, if you can educate a next generation, they, they hopefully will grow up with different beliefs that maybe their fathers and their, and their grandparents did and that then will reduce the, the need for it. I think also, you know, there needs to be tighter restrictions on licensing as a global effort the, the problem you get is different countries have different governments and they all have their own different rules and laws um, uh, and until we you know even when it's illegal to trade in a lot of t animal parts not all countries are signed up to these things uh, and it, it, it just if you can't license it and put in strict and good punishment for for actually catching people um, there's always going to be a problem. You can take, you know, the top person out of a criminal organization and sadly there's going to be someone ready to step into that again. So I think reducing the demand for education is probably going to be key to stopping that. Sure. Okay. I mean, so moving on, one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, obviously people, and it's been in the news, uh, we've seen it slightly, haven't seen the major focus on it really recently, but obviously we're all in a situation here where we're talking to each other on new technology uh, due to due to COVID nineteen, um, but that has been said to have started in you know the wet markets in in China, um, and you know the consumption of animals through that through that trade. I mean, how real is that in in your guys' thoughts, Giles? What do you think? I think the the evidence speaks for itself. If we look at historically the um, other viruses that have come out of these similar situations these similar markets whether they're wet markets or wildlife markets what we've looked at with the likes of SARS and Ebola you know even historically HIV has have thought to have been a, a zoonotic disease that has come from wildlife and crossed over to people it but it's not you know the one thing I would always stress it, it's not the wildlife's fault it's the fact that we have created the circumstances and the situation for uh, you know to allow that viruses those diseases to cross from species to species and then ultimately eventually you know humans if you've ever you know and i can still remember now as i'm sure you know chris going back even you know before i did but i can remember my very first wildlife market and no matter how many I see, you know, the horror never, never gets any easier to deal with where you're talking about hundreds or sometimes thousands of animals that are, are stacked, literally stacked in, in diabolical cages and conditions on top of each other. You know, and you're talking about immense stress where they start to then shed different viruses as well as, you know, all the feces and urine which then allows, you know, contact that otherwise just normally wouldn't happen. And then the, the hygiene conditions that people are then put into in those markets, not only the people that are operating the stores in the market, but also then obviously the customers as well. It, it's just, you know, it's just an accident waiting to happen. And that's why, you know, it's imperative. If there's one silver lining to this, current crisis i hope it really starts to throw the spotlight on on the wildlife trade and the way in which we t treat you know wildlife and when you know people are, are very 
it, it's not about you know there's wet markets all around the world you can go to new york and find wet markets a wet market defines you know somewhere that sells fresh produce but there's a difference between selling you know hygienically um sourced and dealt with chicken and fruit and vegetables to then having thousands and thousands of animals that have been wild caught and or bred in these factory farm conditions and and allow that situation to arise again so yeah, you sure. know as i said i think it's something that we really you know and it's you can understand the amount of suffering that has happened in the last four five months around the world but it, it will happen again unless we change our ways and and you know wildlife markets need to be put in the spotlight yeah absolutely sounds very very real and your experience chris as, as Giles says that back back set up out, out, on, out in the wild then yeah I, i've been to a, a lot of wildlife markets they're disgusting um, it is amazing that we've um, not had global uh, pandemics like this more frequently. Um, and as Giles said, it's going to happen again. As long as these markets are, are permitted to exist and, and continue to operate in the way they do with live animals stacked on dead animals, animals being slaughtered on the spot, um, no refrigeration, uh, you know, very, very unhygienic conditions. Um, as as Giles pointed out, the one silver lining hopefully will be that that these markets, the way wildlife is treated, the way wildlife is viewed, um, and these markets um, change. Policies need to be put in place now. I, I'm I'm afraid that once this pandemic gets under under control, people will just go back to the way things were, and and um, and we just will be sitting waiting for the next one these these markets need to be closed and i know there's a lot of pro wildlife trade activists out there screaming and yelling uh, about about um, the problems with bans and the problems with shutting wildlife trade down etc cetera, etc cetera. the things have to change these markets have to be closed down the wildlife trade has to be uh, become a, a a higher priority and it's not something that we just have to deal with in china there's wild meat markets everywhere people eat wild wildlife everywhere and and the way that's handled and the way that's regulated needs to be put in the spotlight and and improved yeah the one can I, the one thing I'd, I'd add to that though is that we should we should point out that uh, for a, a vast majority of these type of markets it's it's not about the substance in terms of uh, wildlife has to be consumed because there's no other alternative and there, there are a few examples where bushmeat is their um, source of protein but so many of these markets like i went through several markets last year where wildlife was offered for sale and 10 15 meters down the same alleyway you could buy farmed chicken for a fraction of the price as what you could buy the tortoise or the small primate or you know the wild caught snake etc quite often what you find in these markets it, it's about people demonstrating that they can that they have the money and the resources and so therefore they will it, it's not solely about food yeah i guess you know they've got the cultural drives you've got again yeah you know the fact that you can uh, if you're serving tiger bone tea or wine in your house then you know you, you you can get hold of it you can afford it so it's it's a measure it's a measure of wealth but the reality hey, of it, yeah go on Ian, so. the reality of it is if if we keep treating wildlife and you know using wildlife for, and hunting wildlife for food the the way we are at the moment it, you know in 50 years it won't be there that have to be an alternative so why not find the alternative now um, before wildlife is gone because you know if we keep overfishing hunting all these areas to extinction you know most of these animals are, are under threat anyway at least 50 percent of the world's species are under threat at the moment and you know if we carry on in this kind of trend it, it won't be there for the next generation so they'll have to be an alternative uh, and we need to find it now and put it in place uh, and, and then you don't need to use these wildlife markets uh, and hopefully again that, that brings you further away from the disease all over again we're, we're these diseases are coming about basically because we're, we're closer to wildlife than we've ever been before 
uh, and wildlife is in small isolated pockets compared to what it was a few hundred years ago, uh, meaning these diseases spread more rapidly throughout uh, wildlife as well as then back into the, into the human side of it as well. Yeah, so I mean, maybe we've all mentioned it, and maybe the silver lining, as we said, out of this situation that we're in is maybe it's a wake up call for people. You know, it's put us into lockdown this virus. You know, people have changed their attitudes to consumption, hopefully. They've maybe just, you know, made themselves closer to their families and seen what's more important than flying and zooming around the world and consuming everything in sight. So let's hope that that brings us to a different world when we reach the other side. Um, so another topic we wanted to bring in, because, um, yeah, we talk a lot about, or we hear a lot about, um, you know, the trade in wildlife animal parts and, you know, them being used for consumption. But uh, we've talked a little bit, touched on it, about the live uh, wildlife trade. And I think, yeah, Giles, again, uh, just recently, I mean, you were out in Somaliland um, working with the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And, I mean, there's, there's live trafficking of uh, cheetah cubs out there, right? I know, I know exactly. So it's it, uh, all wildlife trade I find is barbaric and, you know, and ultimately starts off with and ends with suffering of the individual animal. But these cheetahs, the demand for, for cheetahs is slightly different than probably most other species of cat in the fact that th th there's a real demand for live cubs in the Middle East. Um, and so what's happening is Cubs are being sourced out of the Horn of Africa, so northern Kenya, Ethiopia, um, some, in that, that region, and then being trafficked across uh, land until Somaliland, where they're then taken across the, the Sea of Aden and start their journey on the other side to whatever the destination country is. And it's, it's absolutely barbaric. You know, like, I would suggest that maybe... 75% of cubs probably don't even make it across to the Middle East and then others would still perish on the other side. So when I visited the, what we call the cheetah safe house in, um, in Hargeisa in Somaliland, CCF at that time were looking after 38 cheetah cubs that were under 16 months of age. Most of them were, you know, tiny, ne almost neonatal little fellas. So again, it, it really does, you know, highlight a different aspect to the trade and if it if if that particular element continues at that rate then their cheetahs will be viably extinct within the horn of africa within a few years because nearly every single cub that you know cheetahs have it incredibly tough in the wild even though they're a big cat they're not as robust as the likes of a leopard or a, or a lion and then quite often will succumb to just natural um issues and other predators so the fact that there's this huge demand and and effectively they end up as trophy pets you know which is which is even more disgusting yeah no horrible horrible to see so I, and Ian, i think you touched on it earlier i mean the exotic pet trade is, is still a thing in the uk he said uh, that that seems really really hard to believe uh, yeah i mean i think it was only last year where they they found an actual tiger farm in uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, and what we need to do uh, is definitely put tougher licensing for all animals, um, you know, all over the world for for keeping exotic pets as uh, or exotic animals as pets. Um, you know, I can't look at a Facebook feed at the moment without seeing a serval, pet monkeys, you know, um, even if if it's rare. Um, snakes and things like that you're, you're seeing them all over the place today and you know actually social media is driving it even more people are, f are getting further away from realizing that it's wrong um and you know these programs glamorize you know keeping these animals a as pets like that which again is just fueling that trade and, and sadly the internet these days if you've got if you've got enough money you, you can get and have whatever you want uh and that seems to be a, a major problem with it as well yeah, sounds like it. Uh, and Chris, I just wanted to touch on because right, right back at the beginning, you said obviously part of Monitor's uh, ethos is to look at sort of lesser known species. Um, you know, we talked about tigers, touched on bears, but so maybe a, a chance to highlight some of the some of the animals that people won't be aware about that are being that are being trafficked. Yeah, well, the the the, the live animal trade, the pet trade, involves far more species than the, the bushmeat trade or the wild meat trade or the traditional medicine trade. 
there's thousands of species um, traded for, for pets and collectors, everything from rare, rare species of beetles to, um, to big cats, everything. Um, we, we've looked at bird markets, songbird markets in Indonesia and, and um, in, in the capital city of Jakarta, we surveyed one large market there, three large markets. It took us three days to count the 19,000 songbirds that we observed there of, of, of a few hundred different species. One of our um, uh, main focus right now is, is looking at the songbird trade because it involves millions and millions of wild caught birds every year. Mortality rates are incredibly high. Um, captive breeding of some species is is starting up and in some cases it's already turning into a laundering issue. There's some species that are now extinct in the wild and only exist in these commercial farms. So, uh, but people aren't aware of this. this the songbird trade is, is huge. Another one, and, and a lot of these birds from Asia are showing up in, in Europe. They're, it's not just an Asian market issue. Um, reptiles is another big one. Pet reptile trade is 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 enormous and worth billions of dollars. It's it's completely out of control. Um, there's there's species of turtles and tortoises that are that are for sale, uh, as was mentioned online everywhere. You can get any species of, of tortoise online, even even the rare plowshare tortoises from Madagascar. Um, we we can find them online and uh, and get those. A anything's available. But again, people aren't aware these, these uh, reptile pet pet reptile markets pet amphibians, pet birds. Um, th these are massive trades, massive problems, massive conservation issues. Uh, most people haven't heard of them and therefore or, um, organizations working on these species aren't getting the support they need, the, the backup or the funding or anything because we're working on species that um, no one's heard about and therefore few people even care about. Yeah. So it's a huge challenge. Yeah. One of the um, one of the officers at Gatwick um, who deal with with wildlife coming in through the, through our major airports, you know, got Heathrow and Gatwick, two of the busiest airports in the world. Um, and from what they were seizing, they they think that that's probably probably only one fifth of of what's actually being smuggled through. So the amount of animals that they are seizing, and I know Giles and me at the parks here have both had phone calls from Heathrow saying that they seized che cheetah with no um, no passport, no records of them coming in. So they were smuggling them in through these busy airports. Um, and it, again, it just it just shows you how, how easy these criminals are doing, how much money must be in it for them to be... To, to be taking those risks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so it's a real problem. It's uh, it's global. It's uh, you know, and it sounds though like you know what we can do about it is is awareness, and you know, hopefully we're doing a bit of that today, talking to the guys that are out there watching on on Facebook Live as part of the our spots and stripes day. But it needs to go further than that, right? So education at the bottom of it, but awareness of the whole situation. Um, I'm aware now also that we're running out of a bit of time, uh, gents. So um, we've got to sign off in a second, but maybe. If you can just go around, starting with you, Giles, just a little bit of a summary about where you think where we are and, and, and what the situation is and just how, how can people help? Well, to, to do that in 30 seconds is not going to be easy, but where we are is uh, we're, at the, we're at the edge of the cliff and we've got some choices to make, but I would say that it's not too late. You know, the one thing that I always take away when we talk about these different species is that they are still hanging on, you know, especially cats. We know that they're incredibly um, robust and resilient for the, for the best part. So, you know, we, but we don't have the luxury of time anymore. We're not talking about decades. And that's where, yes, education is important, but we need action now because it will be too late if we wait for the next generation. So what can people do? You know, well, the obvious one, and it sounds so cliche, is to support organisations that are working on the front line, you know, whether that's uh, organisations like Monitor and what Chris does or some of our other conservation um, partners at the Big Cat Sanctuary. But beyond that, you know, and also looking at the current crisis that we have, it, it's about people need to connect. You know, we need to now really take stock of what's happened and treat the natural world with the respect and compassion that, that it deserves. Yeah, great. Any last messages from you, Ian, on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think yeah, people need to just kind of look at everything, all the products they're buying, try and make sure that you're buying products that are sustainably resourced uh, and that you can follow up on where, where these companies that you're supporting are also getting their products from, whether it's actual, you know, problems with uh, human trade and people using child labor and things, as well as decimating wild areas, you know, they're all linked. So, you know, everything that Giles said and, you know, just please look at sustainably resourced products that you're buying. Great. And last word to you, Chris, out there in Canada. Thank you for joining us. Um, but any, any last message that you, you'd like to get across to everybody? Oh, well, thank you for this opportunity. It's, it's great. Um, I think, as the other guys have said, education and awareness is, is important, but this really is a time for action or, or it's going to be too late. We've already lost a lot of species. There's no excuse to lose anymore. Um, but people need to act. Support conservation organizations, support those kind of efforts, but also contact, you know, call upon your own governments to improve legislation and tighten up enforcement. A lot of countries um, have very weak, very poor legislation when it comes to controlling the, wild, uh, the trade in wildlife that's been illegally sourced in the countries of origin. Once it's in the market, there's very little authorities can, can do in many cases. And these kind of um, policies and, and laws need to be looked at and addressed. And it's up to the public to start making noise about that and, and demanding change and demanding more action against this illegal and unsustainable wildlife trade. Everyone, everyone can do something. Everyone can support conservation projects. Skip a coffee or a beer this week and, and donate that money to a conservation project. Every little bit helps and everyone can do that. Yeah, great. Strong message from everybody and I think that's right. You're not, we're not alone, we can all work together. We've seen that in the situation we're in at the moment you know, and consumer power has got the power to change the way people do stuff and the way governments put together their policies. So, that, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for our very first conservation conversation. Uh, we're hoping to be many more. And uh, we're gonna sign off now and head back to the Big Cat Sanctuary where we've got some more fun and games to, to lighten up the mood a little bit, but add some fun, but also people can, uh, can, can donate today as well. So if you go to the Big Cat Support Fund, you'll not only be caring for the cats that we have obviously here at the Big Cat Sanctuary and the Paradise Wildlife Park Zoological Society in Hertfordshire, but actually, absolutely, we want to forge forward and fund more conservation work, supporting partners out in the field like Chris and his amazing work that he's doing. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for donating if you can. And we'll see you again soon for another conservation conversation. Goodbye.